Land Council, but I've also been very active in the year of uh, this incredible Aboriginal lady by the name of Barangaroo. Um, and I just love the fact that Paul Keaty um, certainly uh, pushed it forward with, with the you know, governments to make sure that we have this beautiful precinct in honour of uh, a Barangaroo and it's re revitalised this incredible woman's spirit because believe you me, she works, walks the uh, foreshores of this country and in particular this area. But I went to an advisory committee where we were talking about, and it was the initial one, second, I think it was the second meeting to talk about uh, what would happen, you know, what would be developed and how we could certainly progress uh, things that, here on the site. And when they talked about Barangaroo, she was always one of Benelong's wives. They didn't mention the fact that she, in fact, was a matriarch. She was a fisherwoman. She was a teacher. Indeed, she was a very wise and clever woman. And uh, Barangaroo, along with Benelong, was invited to the governor's um, a dinner. It was an event. And of course, the request was that they actually came attired in clothing that was provided uh, by the governor of the day. And uh, Ben Long submitted to the request, but Barangaroo eloquently went in a natural attire, naked and a bone between her nose. And um, so then, the reference in the room about Barangaroo was that she was one of Benelong's wives. And if you haven't heard it before, I've said that I remind you that Benelong was one of her husbands. <laughs> <laughs> well, firstly, I'd like to acknowledge all Aboriginal, non Aboriginal, and Torres Strait Island brothers and sisters that are in the room and extend a warm welcome. And I'm aware that many of you have travelled near and far to be here today. I'd like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of land, of the land on which we meet, the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation, and pay my respects to the elders, both past and present, and indeed others that are in the room, as many have made many sacrifices to build a better future for us all. I acknowledge the Gadigal people and pay respects to their culture, identity, and their spiritual ancestors, but they shall always remain within their land. My people, Aboriginal people, have been a part of this land that stretches back through tens of thousands of years and hundreds of generations. There are many Aboriginal nations and tribes and we're all bound by the same unifying elements of culture. And we have one of the world's oldest religious systems. And as there are many different language groups. Our people look with pride upon the depth and the richness of our culture and we do adhere to our spiritual commitment to the land and to each other. For it is through fortitude, courage and wisdom that we have survived the worst of times. And we will continue tendering our sacred ground for the millennium to come. One of the greatest possessions of Australia is that the story of our country from an Aboriginal perspective is remarkable, truly remarkable. And the far reaching story of our Aboriginal culture is that we have a history that is an impressive story, for people that are not aware. We are daring. We are courageous, we are very clever, resourcefulness and resilient. Aboriginal people of Australia are one of the longest unbroken threads of human culture on this planet. And uh, may I say that I believe this is something that Australia should be very, very proud of indeed. Metropolitan Local Aboriginal Land Council promotes a vision of working together as one community and to achieve as one community. And Metropolitan Local Aboriginal Land Council is the cultural authority and custodian of culture, heritage, land and waterways. And our boundaries spans from the Hawkesbury River to the north, the Nepean to the west and the Georges to the south. So it is with respect and honour on behalf of Metropolitan Local Aboriginal Land Council that I welcome you all to the land of the Gadigal people and the Eora Nation as we, you gather today on their traditional land. And I also would like to take this opportunity to um, thank uh, KPMG 
and um, the Human Rights Commission for inviting me to conduct the welcome at your round table for mega sporting event and the impact. Um, but it will know that you will have certainly come up with positive options and solutions given the brilliance that sits in the room. But I'd also just like to share with you um, from a, porti a sporting perspective, um, you know, I was a bit of a, an athlete in my younger days. I used to, you know, fly around that little mission that I grew up on with no shoes on and <laughs> we'd be chasing the dogs away and have to get over to the ration bin before the dogs got there at six o'clock in the morning, you know, when they dropped our bread off. <coughs> but I grew up with an incredible man by the name of Paul Coe Senior. And uh, my grandfather was taken away from his, his, his country and his family at such a, a tender age. Um, Gramps was between three and five. And um, he ended up going to um, the him in Canoundra. There was an orphanage in Canoundra and it was Canoindra. It wasn't Canoundra, it was Canoindra. And um, he went from there to um, Bombardieri Aboriginal Children's Home when they opened that, and then he ended up at, um, actually before that he went to Mittagong, Boys Home and then Bombardieri. And he was farmed out to work with a family, so he was placed to live with them. We shared his story, he told us of how he felt, but he never, never spoke out outside our home about how it did affect him in his own way. But one thing that he was forever grateful for is that he, he learned how to ride a horse and he learned how to shoe and you know, treat and you know, care for a horse. And uh, he was an absolutely brilliant, brilliant horseman. And he held uh, the longest long jump at the Sydney Royal East to show up until um, the 70s, late like 70s, 80s. Uh, I, don't, I think it was a female that may have broken his record thereafter, a female like Diggett, you know? <laughs> but, uh, the beauty of uh, my grandfather is that it taught him to ride um, and it certainly gave him the strength to um, instill a lot of pride in us as, as, as children growing up. But he, he uh, was given a name, the name, the, the, the show name he was given and in those days they used to call him Jimmy, they were all Jimmy's, they weren't Jackie's, they were Jimmy's. And uh, there was a, a brilliant, I think it was a rider that he also, it was, his name was Callaghan, so my grandfather was Jimmy Callaghan. But if you want to do a bit of research, you know, go into Professor Tatz's book, um, you'll see a story on uh, Paul Coe Senior, and he is the grandfather of Paul Coe the second, that radical solicitor or a barrister that was struck off, but yeah, um, an incredible man, my grandfather. He uh, had a street named after him. Had he as a, had, if he had, would have been born in, in at my era, you know, then uh, he certainly would have been an international Olympian that represented Australia for the skills that he had. And also, they they actually started seeing that this is a mega sporting, um, you know, forum um, in Cara in nineteen twenty eight was the first all Aboriginal ref, um, Cara All Blacks football side and uh, there were some rather talented Aboriginal men that played football so um, yeah sports is, is about goodwill but it's also about human rights and it's about justice for, for people in the world that we live in to make it a better place so that we all share it equally. Enough? I would like to once again say welcome to the land of the Gadigal people in it and the Eora Nation. May my people's spirit walk and guide you on your journey throughout your form today. Thank you. Thank you, Auntie Anne. Um, I'm sure we'll hear many stories today. And as a round table and as your MC and your guide today, um, I will be encouraging as much conversation as possible. And after the opening panel, we have a few short introductory uh, comments, and I'll introduce those in a moment. Then we'll have an opening panel. Um, and after the opening panel, we'll have three what I like to term reverse panels, where we'll have some short presentations. Um, 
the opening panel will have is on why. Why are we here? Uh, the panel after that will be looking at commitment. What is it that needs to happen to make a commitment to respect human rights in the context of media sporting events? And the panel after that will be around the challenges. It's just sharing some of the breadth of challenges that come from holding media sporting events in relation to respect for human rights. And then we'll end the day on a positive note and look at the opportunities. And what are those opportunities that media sporting events create and present for all of us? Um, and, uh, and, and then we'll, uh, we'll, we'll finish the day and hopefully answer the question on whether there's enough interest in this area to do more. Now, I would like to next invite Professor Gillian Triggs, uh, the President of the Australian uh, Human Rights Commission. Gillian's combined an academic career with international commercial legal practice and has advised governments and international organisations on law, and in particular, human rights law. She's focused on the implementation of human rights treaties to which Australia is a party, and on working with nations in the Asia-Pacific region on practical approaches to human rights. And Gillian, as you said, is you probably prefer that you did need an introduction these days, <laughs> um, considering the attention that you seem to attract at all of the most, I guess, unexpected times. Hopefully today <laughs> is a day that you attract positive attention. And please, um, do come up and introduce us. I would say we're very proud of KPMG to be able to co-host today with you um, and your colleagues. Um, we've been working very hard over the last couple of months to pull together together. Uh, and I would also acknowledge the role of John Morrison uh, from the Institute for Human Rights and Business. Uh, certainly at KPMG, I think we felt we were wedged there, to use a sporting <laughs> term. And I'm sure we'll have many sporting metaphors today uh, in, in terms of being able to work with both of your, your organisations to uh, organise. Yes, um, a wonderful pleasure to be here today. The roundtable, of course, is now much more like a, uh, a working group, uh, a workshop than, than, than what we had originally envisaged, but of course we couldn't be happier at the Australian Human Rights Commission to see so many of you here to discuss what we think is an enormously important topic. Thank you, Auntie Anne, for your uh, welcome to country, and, uh, and a reminder, of course, that this is um, where Barangaroo fished and walked, <coughs> and uh, we are really privileged to be um, hosted by KPMG in this quite glorious environment, so thank you, Richard, very much indeed. Well, my uh, pleasure today is, of course, to welcome all of you to this round table. Um, we've had an overwhelming interest. Um, it started as a small idea to maybe bring us together to talk about what uh, we could do in light of uh, mega sporting events in the future. Um, but we really didn't imagine that we'd get quite the take up that we've been getting. We have a very distinguished audience here, a wealth of experience in the room, uh, with representatives from sports, from business, government and civil society uh, and I know you'll bring a great diversity of perspectives. Can I particularly welcome those who come from overseas and interstate? Uh, my colleague um, David Rutherford who's the Chief Commissioner uh, of the New Zealand Human Rights Commission and I believe a professional rugby player um, and knows a lot about sport and cares of not only about sport but about human rights and sport. Uh, John Morrison, um, CEO of the Institute of Human Rights. It's just wonderful to have you back in Australia again. We hope we can make this an annual event. You really are a marvellous, uh, well-informed uh, person who really understands the subject and working on it for many years. Uh, Claire Martin, welcome. Claire's from the Northern Ireland Human Rights Commission, and it's a real pleasure for us to have you here. Uh, Stan Smith, um, the Human Rights Ambassador of the Bahamas. Uh, where is he? There, uh, right at the back. But thank you for joining us. It's a real honour to have you with us, um, and you bring a lot of um, a global view and, and a lot of experience. Uh, Mr. Brendan Schwab from the uh, UN Global U Union, based in Switzerland. I'm not sure where you are. There you are. Thank you very much for joining us. Um, Mark Peters, the CEO of Goldock, the, um, the Commonwealth Olympic Games, and of course my colleague Kevin Cox. Uh, the um, commissioner from the Anti-Discrimination Commission in, in, the, in Queensland uh, and we'll be talking more about the opportunities that arise for integrating human rights uh, into the work of the Commonwealth Games. Um, and finally then could I thank Richard um, again it's just remarkable to have this terrific support from you and, and from KPMG. Well we've got a very full program I don't want to take up a lot of your time but I did want to speak very very briefly about the role of human rights in these mega sporting events. 
The fundamental principles of Olympism, as established by the Olympic Charter, are founded in respect for human dignity. And indeed, the practice of sport is a human right in itself. In 2014, the United Nations Sport Development and Peace International Working Group said that sport is a fundamental right for all, indicating that sport can be a powerful tool with which to further develop human rights and to remove barriers to reduce inequalities and to promote peace. And perhaps the, the, the best and oft-quoted language is that of Nelson Mandela, who understood this perhaps better than most, about the, spa, the power of sport. He said, sport has the power to change the world. It has the power to inspire, inspire, the power to unite people in a way that little else does. It speaks to youth in a language they understand. Sport can create hope where once there was only despair. Well, unfortunately, we know that sport can sometimes fall short in realising its potential. Uh, earlier this year, Amnesty International revealed that migrant workers building the Khalifa International Stadium in Doha for the 2022 World <coughs> Cup um, exhibited some systemic abuses and in some cases even forced labour. In 2016, the Olympics this year at Rio, we also saw violations of children's rights and other civil rights, including evictions, police violence, and poor labour conditions. Human rights violations were widespread also at the 2010 Commonwealth Games in India, where the walking poor were evicted from their homes and workplaces, girls and women were trafficked for prostitution, and beggars criminalised and displaced. Well, in Australia, we cannot assume that human rights are not relevant to the conduct of mega sporting events in this country. Indeed, the 2018 Commonwealth Games on the Gold Coast will be an event in which the eyes of the world will be on Australia, and we do need to ensure that human rights are an integral aspect of every element of the planning and operation of these games. Well, the purpose of today's event is to discuss how to achieve that integration. And the Commission has, in particular, uh, welcomed the opportunity of the 2018 Gold Coast Games Corporation, uh, Goldock, uh, to bring a human rights-based approach to these games. In fact, it was really interesting. We had a meeting in my office with the Commonwealth Games Secretariat, as, as well as those from the corporation. And it was really remarkable how uh, they understood what we were asking them to think about. Um, and within weeks, they had produced a draft of a human rights document that might integrate those principles into the operation of the Commonwealth Games. Um, I don't think Glasgow 2014 Commonwealth Games, which was the first mega sporting event to adopt formally a human rights is continuing also under the strong leadership of the Commonwealth Games Federation itself, which in its 2022 strategic plan has set out a strong commitment to and respect for human rights. Of foreign Affairs and the Institute for Human Rights and Business co-hosted the Global Sporting Chance Forum on mega sporting events and human rights in Washington. Today's roundtable aims then to build on that initial work and to continue that conversation in Australia. So it, it's a huge pleasure to see so many of you here. Um, good luck for the discussions. I, I think we really have all that it takes, all the ingredients in this room, to start to build the standards for integrating human rights as part of these games. So thank you all for coming, um, and good luck with your discussions. Thank you very much. Thank you, Julian. Um, I'd now like to invite Kevin Cox, who's a highly respected human rights and disabilities advocate um, and is the current Commissioner of Anti-Discrimination Commission in Queensland. Um, a, uh, a position that he held with an initial four-year appointment and he's just been reappointed for an additional 12 months. Um, in fact, I think your appointment still continues for another year, is that right? Thank goodness I've got that right in Australia and also the Australian Human Rights Medal in 2005. Now, One of the first things we'll do is get a universally designed for today's, I'd say, many round tables or square table, rectangle tables. <laughs> um, also, I'd like to acknowledge the Gadigal people, the traditional custodians of the land that we um, gather here today. In the spirit of reconciliation, I'd also like to acknowledge the traditional custodians on the land that I was born and raised, and that is the 
Mitra and Kenilroy peoples. Since Baron Pierre de Coverin revived the Olympic Games for the modern era in 1984, upon her ideals of harmony between nations, solidarity and fair play, the Olympics have not only succeeded in bringing together athletes from all continents to participate in regular visits, the festivals of sport and culture, they and other mega sporting events have also played important symbolic roles in promoting human rights. Of course, several MSEs have been marred by human rights uh, controversies as Julian has outlined. However, we've also seen symbolic and very important points of human rights being raised. For example, um, in 19, uh, sorry, um, 1968 Mexico Olympics with Tommy Smith and J Jimmy John Carlos <coughs> at the medal ceremonies where the iconic conic clenched fist salute, but also supported by the Australian Peter Norman, who ran second in that race and still holds the national record. And of course, as an advocate for human rights, there are always costs. And Peter Norman's family certainly says he paid a huge cost for taking that stand. Um, and there's, of course, our own Cathy Freeman who in the 1994 Commonwealth Games and the 2000 Sydney Olympic Games, by carrying both the Aboriginal flag and the Australian flag in her victory lap. After winning the 400 metre race in Sydney, um, Cathy stated, well, she carried those flags, I hope the expression of pride in her heritage would counter negative stereotypes. She stated, this race, this was my race, and no one was going to stop me from telling the world how proud I was to be Aboriginal. Somewhere deep inside, I'd observed all the pain and suffering my people had endured and turning it into a source of strength. It is in this spirit that I believe the Commonwealth Games in 2018 provides us with a perfect platform, not only to acknowledge human rights and symbolically address some of the barriers faced by population groups whose human rights are yet to be fully protected, respected and fully realised in Australia and the world. It provides us with an opportunity to leave a lasting legacy not only at the Gold Coast precinct, but within the Australian footprint of human rights. Just to take stock of two population groups who I would argue experience institutional and structural discrimination daily <coughs> in Australia, and these are Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people and people with disability. The majority of both populations are underemployed by four to five times the rate of non-Indigenous and non-disabled people. A significant number of people live in poverty, have poorer health outcomes, are overrepresented both as victims of crime and offenders in the criminal justice system. And the list continues. The opportunity for long-lasting legacies to overcome institutional and structural discrimination arise in the daily business of government and private sector, such as procurement policies. Not only should government agencies provide leadership in building inclusive and diverse workforces, businesses set targets in all contexts of their function, function sales targets, timeliness targets, etc. Westpac, for example, set a target for employment of people with disability 
and now 13% of all employees within Westpac have a disability. This procurement policy could require tenders to demonstrate policies, practices relating to inclusive and diverse workforces and targets for employment of certain population groups. One of the criteria that would be essential in evaluating both government and the private sector strategy to build inclusive and diverse workforces will be examine their strategies to overcome unconscious bias in the recruitment, employment and retention of employees from diverse backgrounds. <coughs> Another is the National Building Code. It is imperative that government at all levels provide leadership today to ensure current and future Queenslanders and Australians have the barriers removed that significantly restrict their opportunities to live and participate, both socially and economically, in their chosen community. I have been involved in conversations to mandate universal design in Queensland and Australia since the late 80s. Livable housing is a partnership between community and consumer groups, government and industry. The livable housing champions the mainstream adoption of um, livable housing design principles in all new homes built in Australia. The Livable Housing Agreement arose from the Curability Dialogue on Universal Design in 2010, which established national agreed guidelines on designing and building livable homes. The voluntary strategy has failed and will continue to fail to deliver accessible housing whilst ever they are voluntary regulations. The societal cost of this inaction to provide basic access and use housing are ultimately shifted to the health, disability and aged care sectors and individuals and their families. For example, in Queensland, costs are shifted to the Department of Health, Housing and Public Works, Department of Health, Department of Communities, Child Safety and Disability Services, through avoidable hospital stays, the acute care and rehabilitation of injuries resulting <coughs> from slips, trips and falls, costly home modifications, and the inefficient use of home-based nursing, support and aids, and equipment in poorly designed home environments. And of course, individual families also bear the costs. They pay for modifications, provide care in risky home environments and often are required to inappropriately place their loved ones in nursing homes and specialist facilities. That was my fate at the age of 21. Many people with disability and older people become marginalised and isolated because they cannot visit the homes of their family and friends. I also believe that accessible tourism needs to be factored in the conversation when we consider in the context of any regulatory impact statement on accessible provisions in the Building Code of Australia. The industry, the tourism industry relies on certainty and currently it cannot provide certainty in the provision of accessible tourism experience and markets. Thus, the Australian and Queensland tour tourist industry misses out on developing and capturing a significant tourist market. Thus, um, markets and millions of dollars. There is over 17 years of research in Australia and worldwide that demonstrates the cost to, to the tourist industry by not having an accessible industry. The cornerstone of accessible tourism is accessible accommodation. 
Just to give you an example, last Easter, I tried to find an accessible home on the Gold Coast to take myself and nine of my family members and my pet dogs. I found 15 pet-friendly accommodation sites, but no accessible accommodation. I compromised, went without a shower for that Easter weekend and paid two and a half thousand dollars. For example, the Australian Chinese Business Council forming Australia. It states that Chinese tourists will be worth 140 billion to Australia by 2025. The Chinese culture highly respects and values their elders. And as the ageing population grows, so will the rate of mobility and other impairments grow. We'll miss out on accessing the full potential of local Chinese and Asian tourist markets because of the lack of certainty and accessible accommodation. I only have touched on some of the human rights issues that we can make significant gains in. I look forward to hearing and contributing to the conversations and actions arising from today. Thank you. Thank you very much, Julian and uh, Kevin for the frame. Uh, our first panel, our opening panel this morning. Could I ask my opening panelists to step up, Lynn, Sam, and John? and uh, take a seat. And we will also now attempt to cross international boundaries and see if we can also dive into today. While they're coming up, I would just like to introduce our opening panelists. That's right, you can fight over the square. That's sort of uh, David Grevenberg is Chief Executive of the Commonwealth Games Federation. David joined the Federation after the 2014 Commonwealth Games, where he was Chief Executive of the Organising. Uh, before that, David was the Executive Director of Sport and International Federation Relations at the International Paralympic Committee, headquartered in Bonn, Germany. He's a, he's a former competitive wrestler. Um, during his career, he's also served as a coach, athlete agent, team administrator, consultant and board member. David, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Uh, ah, there we go. But, uh, welcome. We'll we'll just um, get you plugged into the room so the whole room can hear you and not just myself. And my okay, great. Thank you. All right. Thanks. I need to go. Hopefully not. Okay, so apparently my mic is on. And that one. It is good. Thank you. All right. Uh, David, welcome. Can I just check that everyone can hear you? Yes, hi. Hi, everyone. Can everyone hear David? Yes. Hi. Yes. Yeah? Oh, very good. Okay, that's the first hurdle overcome. <laughs> Lynn Anderson. I'm just going to introduce the rest of the panel that you're speaking on, David, so just bear with us as I move through the panel. Um, Lynn Anderson was appointed CEO of the Australian Paralympic Committee in August 2015. Lynn has more than 15 years' experience helping all sectors of the industry, including sport, sponsors, government, media and marketing. Um, currently on the uh, board of the Gold Coast Titans, NRL, uh, and the Australian International Military Group. Lynn was formerly Deputy Chair of the Parramatta Stadium Trust and has been on the boards of the 2002 Melbourne World Masters Games and Camp Quality. You've got a personal ambition to see Paralympians recognised as elite sports people in the same way others are. I can just put that one out there. Sam Austin, welcome. Sam Austin serves on a number of boards across corporate sports, not for profits, aid and arts sector. Is there any sector that you don't serve on board? <laughs> just checking, Sam. In 2005, you were appointed uh, to the AFL um, as the first woman to take a commissioner role. Uh, and you sat on the boards of Sports City, the Indigenous Advisory Council, and the Women in Football Advisory Group. Um, you now sit on the Business and Sustainable Development Commission, where human rights in business is a key topic in the context of the Sustainable Development Goals. And you've enjoyed a diverse career, 
ranging from policy advisor to the former PM Paul Keating. I've yet to ask you about that one. I need to learn more. Um, women's advocacy, sports, sustainability, and the arts. John Morrison, welcome. Uh, a leading practitioner and thinker on issues relating to social responsibilities of government, business, and civil society. Currently executive director of the Institute for Human Rights and Business. Um, you've written and spoken widely on human rights, um, including international migration, corporate responsibility, including your most recent book, The Social Licence, How to Keep Your Organisation Legitimate. I hope you appreciate I got a plug-in for your book there, John. Um, that we are here today is no small part to John's groundbreaking advocate, advocacy work on mega-sporting events and human rights. The Institute for Human Rights and Business was the co-convener with the US Department of State and the Swiss Federal Department of Foreign Affairs uh, for the Sporting Chance Forum on mega-sporting events and human rights, which was held just over two weeks ago in Washington, D.C. And I know there's a number of you who are here today who also attended that, including Nikki um, and David. I think you were there as well. And have I forgotten anyone else who was there two weeks ago? Brendan, that's right. Brendan, welcome. Ah, good to meet you, Brendan. Um, so looking forward to hearing your insights and your takeaways in terms of what I think is arguably to date the largest um, conference um, in terms of mega sporting events and human rights with 100 and over 150 people. Yeah. Yep. 150. Um, so very much looking forward to our first panel. I'll, I'm just going to kick off and ask each of the panelists a, a key question to get us going. The room is suddenly feeling a little cooler. Is that everyone else's experience or is it still hot? I'm, I'm here to look after you today, so if there's issues <laughs> with the room, you know who's responsible. Um, I, I, look, I do need to quickly, uh, I think, just share a, a personal anecdote. And, and certainly in terms of my 20 plus years in working on the issue of business and human rights, um, it is the personal stories that are often the ones that cut through that do lead to different perspectives and, and potentially different behaviours. And, and for me, it was during the Paralympics, um, because I have two children who are wheelchair users, and, and my daughter's 10 years old, and um, Kurt Fernley's taken quite a shine to her, which, which has... All right. I'm going to stand back and maybe that makes sense. David, I think your phone is making a few noises. Just bear with us. Um, and uh, during the Paralympics, and we, the first one we watched was the opening ceremony, and there's my daughter at uh, 6 a.m. watching the opening ceremony. And uh, hey, Steve, can you get closer in just to see if we can sort that out? I'm, yeah, I'm, getting feedback. I'm getting feedback as well. So. Yeah, no, there's a little bit of interference in the room. We've got the uh, technician who I think was far too quick to leave the room thinking he'd sorted it all. <laughs> anyway, um, <laughs> he has done that to me a few times before, so he generally stays longer. Yeah, we'll, we'll have him back in a moment. Um, okay, the blood thing on the curve. Okay, okay. And, and Dave, could I just ask maybe you put your phone on mute for a moment? Would that work? Can we just try that? Yep, I, I, I've, been doing, I've been doing that, so okay. I'll, I'll put it back on. Thank you very much. Um, and as the um, Australian contingent came out, um, she had a moment where she said, oh, this, you know, she was looking for Kurt. And then she turned to us and she said, oh, I have never seen so many people in wheelchairs on TV at the one time. Mm. And that, for me, was just that moment when I realised the power and the opportunity that sport had. Um, while Billy might never be a Paralympian, it was that moment that made her feel that she was part of our community, that she was part of, and she spends far too much time watching TV, I have to say, <laughs> that TV actually spoke to her and included her. So, there's my story. Now, John, why are we here? Can I make it as simple as that? Uh, I'm not sure this is all. So long? Yes, it's on. There you go. Um, well, I know why I'm here, Richard. I don't know. <laughs> uh, thank you, Richard, Gillian, and, uh, and Kevin. Um, I think we're here because actually the first ever conference I know about on human rights and sporting events took place in this city in 1999. Yeah. I don't know if any of you were at that um, in 2003. That, that, that's what opened my mind. 
And of course, the stories go a long way back. And if you think Coca-Cola has sponsored the Olympics since 1928, in the Berlin Olympics in 1936 are clearly, you know, a salient mm. uh, reminder of what it means to get this wrong, um, and how events, not just as a celebration of human excellence, can be a, can be the opposite. Um, so I, I just want to say three things. I, First, that there is a problem. I, I, mean, I think everybody in the room is here because they know there's something to talk about. Um, if you just want to talk about fatalities, Commonwealth Games in New Delhi, 50 people died in the construction phase. Brazil, FIFA 2014, nine people died. Uh, three have died so far in Qatar, directly related to the construction of the stadia. I and mean, if, you, if you cast it more widely, many more fatalities clearly in Qatar, and uh, we could go on to talk about Moscow, we could talk about the risk around Tokyo 2020 as well. Um, clearly the wider issues, land appropriation, evictions, um, security abuses, construction, freedom of expression, discrimination. It, if you think about business and human rights, it's just about every issue you can think of it comes into the six to eight year life cycle of these events. Um, and the DC event that several of us were at last week, I think, began to build out of a discussion we've been having in my own organization since London 2012. But it begins now, I think, to get some traction. Um, and the, uh, the Swiss government, you know, hosts the majority of world sports bodies. If you think about revenues from sponsors and broadcasting, the US territory probably sees more of those revenues than any other national territory, although that's shifting uh, around the globe at the moment. So the, to have those two governments now stepping up, I think begins to push us forward. Still the beginning, um, but we're beginning to move. I think those of us two weeks ago, when we heard the rights of communities from Rio, I mean, the, the, the experience of the mother whose son had been shot by the police, during the, the cleansing in advance of the World Cup in 2014, to hear the, um, the other woman who'd been evicted, evicted because of Rio 2016 from her favela, to hear the, you know, the story of the, uh, the female Muslim basketball player who cannot compete internationally anymore because you can't wear a hijab under international FIBA rules, but if she was a soccer player, she would be able to. Um, I mean, you could go on and on and on. Um, so there's clearly something to talk about. And I, I'd also add the social license issues of sporting events themselves. I mean, like the Commonwealth isn't as, as big in financial terms as IOC or FIFA events, but they are still, if you think about participation and viewing, they are still clearly mega sporting events. But just in the IOC world, Boston, Hamburg, Oslo, and now I believe Rome have all pulled out of shortlists of hosting Olympic events in the past two years. Many stadia were half empty in Rio this summer. There is a crisis in mega sporting events. Not all of this is human rights related. There's corruption, there's ethics, there's the economics of these things. A lot of people don't believe that the economics stack up anymore. Um, but human rights, I think, sits amongst this cluster of issues. So I think we're here, the why is is a bigger why, but human rights is at the beginning of it. And I, I think Richard, we're also here because what struck us early on when we did work in Brazil in 2014 is you'd imagine with the FIFA World Cup and the Olympics two years later that FIFA and the IOC were sharing practices on social impact with nothing. No exchange, very little at all. In fact, deliberate distancing. Why not? Because, well, you have to ask the IOC and FIFA yeah. these questions. But, uh, um, now that we, you know, we had IOC and FIFA on the panel together two weeks ago in, 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 in DC with, with David from Commonwealth. Uh, maybe David, you can touch on this more political issue of, of why they don't. But there is clearly a lack of learning also within the, the sports traditions themselves. So London 2012 hands over to Rio, but doesn't hand over to Tokyo. And there's no independent oversight body for Rio to pick up the learnings of the, of, of the oversight body in London that picked up a lot of these issues. Just to finish, Richard, there is an opportunity now. Mm. Commonwealth has been mentioned. IOC and FIFA have already 
also now made um, human rights commitments, IOC is part of our process too. FIFA has made human rights commitments during this year. So there is an opportunity. Mm -hmm. um, moving forward, we've got to establish trust. It's got to be a collective action process. We've got to hear about the voices of victims. We've got to involve more governments, more sports bodies from around the world. Um, colleagues in this room have been involved in writing 13 white papers that we'll publish on Human Rights Day on the 10th of December that begins to flesh out what the responsibilities and duties are of sports bodies, host cities and countries, sponsors and broadcasters, and affected groups. Those get four buckets. And the last thing is on your tables, you'll see the principles that the Swiss and American governments have developed. Um, please take these away. Uh, those governments are reaching out to other governments and other actors to support these principles. It's just the beginning, but it would be great to see the Australian government behind these principles. As yeah. well. And on those white papers, I think yeah. you're okay for us to share those for comment with the participants today? Yeah, today, is the, well, today was the last day for comments. Oh, <laughs> That's the okay. problem. Um, but they will be shared. I mean, there'll be public documents by the 10th of December. Yeah, 10th I know. Um, some of the authors of those papers sit in this room, yeah. so specific papers can be shared, I think, even during November. With, um, so uh, we maybe I could set out at some point later today just a list of what the papers are, and then people can come forward. And but that's, that's, that's why we're here, I think. Now, you talked economics, and, yeah. and Sam, I, I guess from your perspective, I mean, why should those who have a significant economic stake in their sporting events be considering the human rights risks and impacts? Um, it's, a, it's a good question and a tricky question. Mm -hmm. And I can only give um, evidence from a national sporting body rather than a mega sporting global body through my experience at the AFL. Um, you can start just with the, the, the sheer presumption that I think others have already spoken about, which is a better event makes more money. So a, be a better event that includes all is a better event for the organisers. And that, that's just a cruel sort of acknowledgement that these events um, are expensive and need, uh, the, the more inclusive you are, the more you're going to entertain your audiences and find them engaging with your sport. So, and if you make a mistake about that, you equally lose your social licence um, and you find yourself in all sorts of trouble very quickly. Um, the two examples I give on the positive and negative, I'll start with the negative. The AFL a couple of years ago, many may remember, um, heralded the fact that um, tens of thousands of footies were going to be distributed to children in the lead up to the grand final, the, the ultimate AFL event, regarded as its best event of the year. Um, and in the lead up to that, an investigative journalist discovered that the balls were being manufactured in terrible conditions in India with women and girls. There'd been no um, acknowledgement of the supply chain issues. There's, there was a fairly poor procurement, a very bad procurement model in place, and it took a deep investigation into that um, the background to those balls bringing to the fore to the AFL, the fact that they were sitting on top of a shocking set of human rights abuses. And of course, the public immediately um, were angry, upset, skeptical, um, and that, that, lead, that can take you down a path very quickly of lack of social license. And people who say, well, I'm not going to go to the grand final this year, or I'm not going to pay my kids um, fees this year, or I'm going to choose a different sport where I know that there is a, um, a committed um, commitment to, um, to the supply chain and human rights. That's just a simple one, but the organisation itself didn't know how it was manufacturing its own footballs. So it was a. So if you want to make money as a sporting body, a sporting hand, you sign two football clubs hosted the first fully inclusive game at Etihad Stadium in Melbourne to invite people of all um, gender persuasions, all sexual orientation, to a game in their honour. It's called the Pride Game. St Kilda hosted it uh, with Sydney uh, travelling to Melbourne for the event, and it was a celebration of all forms of sexuality and being welcomed at a sporting event. First time the AFL had ever done that. I think it's the first time that the Etihad Stadium had ever welcomed anyone of any sexual orientation into the ground specifically. And to meet people who had felt frightened about going to football, as a gay person, as a trans person, um, as transgender, whatever their concerns were, they hadn't gone to the footy because they thought it was a, a place where they weren't welcome. And to see the transition of the, the St Kilda's um, own club stats say we expect to see more of that um, inclusion type behaviour in our, in our sporting organisations, but particularly the AFL. And the second leg of that is the start of a women's league in the AFL. I mean, women, women's rights and women's ability and desire to play that game have been known for 50 or 60 years, but there was no, there was no, no one in the AFL really 
thinking about the fact that these were the rights of women as opposed to it being a difficult thing to the men's game. We're kind of tolerating women in management now and on the commission, <laughs> but we seriously have to run a game for the women, aren't they just the great mums and supporters of the men? And so a whole new conversation opened up. Um, and it starts, I think it starts with rights, the rights of women to play their game. Was that the language that you used? Because I mean, that was an eight year campaign for you yeah. personally. I mean, what was the language that you used to open up? Well, I, I just started around the commission table saying I couldn't believe that we didn't celebrate women who wanted to play in the same way we're celebrating men. And particularly your, your story about your daughter seeing wheelchairs on a television screen. The, the girls who want to play footy and want to have a pathway and be respected for their ambition only got a sense of that when they saw an exhibition match broadcast on television. They sat in the rooms with their families and saw girls, women playing fully at the elite level, and suddenly he said, I could be that. And I, didn't think I, I, th I thought I was excluded from that. I thought it was my brother's role. And I've been switch switching across from football to netball or basketball or soccer. And now they don't, they see themselves. Now, if you go back to the economics, there hasn't been a better economic um, opportunity for the AFL than introducing the women's league, just because the, the sheer numbers of women who want to play, the, um, the merchandise that will come with this, the club memberships that will come with this, the entire, um, engine behind the AFL will benefit enormously, but that's not what was done. But you know, it, it certainly gives it a lot of support. But they're just simple examples of, of just just thinking about the rights of people who who don't fit the traditional form of a man playing football, someone whose sexuality and gender um, is quite different to what fully thought it was actually dealing with in terms of fans and players, and then women and people with disabilities in and in, in creating new forms of sport for those who want to play in a different form. Um, so th there's an economic case there, but I don't like to use that as the only reason why you do it. But you do sit on a number of Australian corporates, major brands. Is there also a dimension there from a potential sponsor of a major mega sporting event to have been associated with sports where there are human rights issues and human rights challenges? And what's that conversation that you've had or you yeah, might have? Yeah. Isn't that right? I think John's already covered it with Coca-Cola. I mean, no mega sporting event, no national sporting event exists without sponsors um, and corporate partners. And increasingly, those corporate partners have a very, very strong view about the behaviour of the sporting entity and the, um, and the arenas in which you play. And so to take the risk as a director of those sporting organisations that you are now managing the risk of your sponsors and your partners and to think they don't care is hugely risky. And I think increasingly for the whole social licence point of view and a relationship between a sponsor and the ultimate game that is, or, or event that is shown to the public, you can't mess that up or sponsors will walk away and you, you lose your... And then does, uh, I guess the, because we've recently, as recent as last week, um, in terms of climate change and the impacts of climate change, um, we've had some very eminent legal minds in the country say that their interpretation of fiduciary duties would include the impacts of climate change. Yeah. Could we see a day where that could include you know, the impact, human rights impacts as well? well uh, Richard points to a, a document that's just been released today for the first time, which is a QC opinion on uh, whether fiduciary duties of company directors includes a, a duty of risk around climate change. And the QC says, absolutely, it's there. It's, this is no longer just a theoretical um, risk, it's a real risk. And I think you're right to draw the parallel back into human rights, because I can imagine sitting on my boards that a human rights abuse that's known today that we fail to deal with that has consequence will have a fiduciary duty. And I imagine those sitting on major sporting boards or um, particularly infrastructure boards building these um, mega um, stadia and, and events will also have foreseeability right now about the human rights impacts, the loss of sponsors through failure to act in accordance with a human rights tradition. All those things I think will have consequence. And that's a good thing. I mean, that's, that's why directors sit on boards. You are meant to actually understand those risks um, and deal with them as part of your leadership and governance of, a, of an entity. So I can see that coming, and I'm, I wouldn't be surprised by it. And it's a good thing to have that rigour around directors' insights and understanding about what really we're dealing with here. David, um, you can come off mute. <laughs> um, okay, there we go. Uh, hopefully, um, we've got that microphone working as well. We have to make sure that's on. Is that on, Casey? It's on. It is on. Excellent. So hopefully the room can hear you better as well. Um, David, in terms of your journey, um, and I guess the Glasgow Games being the first Commonwealth Games where the organising committee put together a human rights statement, why? Um, and what does that mean for where we are today?
So please keep in mind we haven't watched your video. Jeff Andrews, um, and particularly the Commonwealth Sports Movement, went to the Commonwealth. And why is it relevant? Um, why is it relevant? And you know, why should people give a care? And so um, we really had to do some soul searching and some deep digging um, to get people to reflect on what uh, the Commonwealth was to them, what it meant to them, and uh, ultimately uh, why it was so important. Because after all, we're calling these games the Commonwealth Games. And if people don't identify with the word Commonwealth, um, and we're not clearly articulating that, then there's obviously a brand um, issue there. But it also comes down to you know, making the most of the investment. And, uh, the Commonwealth Games have historically been heavily government uh, government invested um, uh, with uh, some great commercial partners as well. Um, but you know, if, I go, if I go back to the vulnerable period of our movement, we had to really ask ourselves the question, question of who are we? And what really came out of that discussion was that people said, well, you know, um, I believe in the Commonwealth because of the selfless leadership of Her Majesty Mandela, Gandhi, um, Bob Marley, we name it, people identified with the leadership. They also identified with the good, the bad, and the ugly of the history, heritage, and tradition um, of the Commonwealth. And that was something that uh, wasn't surprising. Uh, many people would come back talking about the neo-colonialist ambitions of the Commonwealth, um, or colonialism, or empire, or imperialism. And that was you know, a very honest take um, on it. But then people also came uh, forward and said, well, the Commonwealth Secretariat and the, and the work of the Commonwealth Agency bodies upholding the Commonwealth Charter of this modern, progressive, contemporary, forward-thinking movement of sorts. And this was what was probably most compelling in terms of, well, what does the Commonwealth mean uh, today um, in terms of a force for good? Well, it, you know, the, the Charter really outlined four basic areas, to drive peace, prosperity, good governance, and human rights. And in doing that, um, you know, we, we are an agency, we are one of many associations um, um, affiliated with the Commonwealth that has uh, the responsibility. So over the past, uh, over the, in, in the lead up to Glasgow, um, we obviously took as an organizing committee um, a very uh, a bold approach to upholding um, some of those principles, but also reflecting on the good, the bad, and the ugly of the past, um, but also highlighting the amazing leadership that we have in the Commonwealth, um, starting with the head of the Commonwealth, Her Majesty, and her uh, a ambition uh, to push uh, reconciliation and empowerment, um, you know, as, as, as a vehicle to the Commonwealth. So, you know, pushing these issues forward, um, you know, we, we uh, as a movement, over the past two years, have restructured our vision, have restructured uh, the way that we're working, um, in terms of an organizing committees, um, and we found that human rights um, is not just uh, something that we have to do as a, as a risk management uh, condition. It's a responsibility, no doubt, but it is, it is also an enormous opportunity to maximize the impact. Um, and what this is really, this, this, this whole venture has allowed us to do is redefine how we look at success. The success is not just the commercialization of our product. It's also the positive impact that we have on the citizens and communities of the Commonwealth, and obviously further afield where possible. But you know, we, we, what we've done is essentially changed our vision um, as an organization that uh, looks to build peaceful, sustainable, and prosperous communities globally by inspiring Commonwealth athletes and that's given a destination to Commonwealth athletes to drive the ambition and impact of all Commonwealth citizens through sport. And so this, this is very much uh, part of this journey. We work very, very closely uh, with uh, John Morris and his team at the Institute uh, for Human Rights and Business. And obviously, they've been working very closely on the steering group. They've been working with our organizing committees 
as well and their government partners to really uh, make sure that we're not leaving any stone unturned in terms of asking the right question, but then also identifying the opportunities we have for you know for the for the time period we have to make a much uh, positive uh, difference um, in, in, in with you know depending on the context uh, that we possibly can. So you know that's that, that, that in a nutshell in terms of why we've taken this particular issue so seriously. And, and in terms of um, achieving uh, those opportunities and I guess achieving that vision, what, what do you see as the most significant challenge around human rights for the, Com for the Commonwealth Games Federation, David? You know, I think, uh, you know, it, it, it's a combination of, you know, some, some, some people are ignorant to what human rights really is and what it means. And I think the, the educational aspect, so building awareness, um, is clearly identifying um, what areas of advocacy are going to work within the context. Because every, you know, whether you're in a, a emerging market or a regenerative market or a more sustained market, we have issues, but they're usually very contextual. And getting everyone um, as a baseline on some of the universal uh, principles of business and human rights uh, at a very first point, and making people very aware of what those mean and, um, and, what, and what they are, and, and getting that overriding commitment to, to stand up. And then it's getting people uh, to, a, to a point and I keep going back to people, it's people and partnerships. All of these major events do not happen without people and partnerships. So people are granted an opportunity for six to seven years to, to, to make some amazing change if they choose. Now, you know, I, I'm a firm believer, uh, you know, so let's, not, let's not take the opportunity to miss the opportunity <laughs> and driving, uh, just trying to drive a change. And I think it's just getting people to commit, own, and champion human rights as part of these journeys in their context, and to try to do as much good as possible along that journey. And every you know, every day you don't do something is a missed opportunity that you could have done something. And I think it's incredibly important that when you're working on such a gift that you're given around these major events, because it's a time-based project that has a definitive end Every, it focuses the mind and everyone gets behind it and everyone wants it to be a success. You know, when done right, with that type of energy and that type of power, you know, you, you, you can do a lot of good. Um, at the same time, to deliver an amazingly powerful and inspiring and fun event, um, it's done the right way. I think we should have had you say that at the end of today, uh, and left us on a, uh, you know, a very inspirational and uh, forward-looking note there. Um, look, that, that, I'm just going to ask Lynn to, to offer her perspective uh, and then uh, look to open up for questions from the floor. So we'll come back to you, David. So please, please don't go away. Um, and in case it fright the idea frightens you, there is a very large sort of um, you know, maybe two metre high portrait of you being displayed around the room. So everyone's well aware of what you look like. Um, Lynn, you, when we spoke, you talked about, you know, David's just emphasised, you know, people. We, we need to keep that focus on people. And, and I guess just to kind of draw on a reflection from the National Dialogue on Business and Human Rights that, that happened on Friday um, with the UN Global Compact and uh, Network Australia and the Australian Human Rights Commission, um, it was interesting to hear the conversation arise there that human rights is politicised. And in some ways, David, I think that's what you're, you know, you're moving around, is in fact talking about human rights as, as something that's about people. And, and when we talked, Lynn, you talked about voice and that, you know, what you're looking to do and what you're hoping to achieve in, in terms of your leadership of the Paralympic Committee um, is to provide the same level of voice. That, that other athletes have and that other sports have. And, and I guess <coughs> I'm curious in your perspective around, you know, why would we be sitting here? Why have you said yes to coming up on this panel um, in terms of your perspective? Hey, um, can you hear me? No. Not yet. That's all right. Where's off it works? Hello? Yeah. <laughs> Had it on all the time? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes. 
scary. Um, look, I'm here today, firstly, or why I think, but certainly just most recently was part of obviously the Rio Paralympic Games, albeit as a, a competitor, I suppose, in terms of we provided a team. Um, I think, and I agree with what you said earlier, um, John, I think, I think the major bidding process is at a really critical juncture. Um, I think it's got to a point that is clearly not sustainable under the current model. Um, so there will be absolutely questions asked of the major rights holders. We're talking the ISCs, the FIFAs, the Commonwealth Games uh, Federation itself. So whenever there's a time for you know looking back and, and looking forward at the same time and, and putting it under scrutiny, there's the opportunity to jump in to try and achieve more <coughs> than what we believe is happening now. And I think everyone agrees that, that much more needs to be done. Um, so I'm really keen to hear the process. I mean, the logic of any business um, model elsewhere is that you start at the very beginning. And the, one of the things I've learned from being in the Paralympics, albeit only 15 months, is that my guys who've been there for a lot uh, longer than that and our athletes basically say it just needs to be at the front of all the planning. It needs to be saying this is the market we're looking at, these are the core segments, whether they're women, whether they're people with a disability, and then you start the planning. And I think if you have that obligation, it's not an afterthought and the questions that need to be asked start being asked up front. So I'm sure that a lot of that, and um, Mark, I'm sure if I'm hearing really good things, I'm keen to know about what you've done, but I think that process obviously has started with you guys. Um, so I'm keen, as I said, to just understand how do you make that happen when we know these, these processes are politicised and they're now becoming politicised from the consumer activist side. I'm sure everyone is aware that Boston 20, Boston No campaign are now you know, travelling around the world and have had some successes with what they're doing. So that, that I think is an exciting opportunity as opposed to negative. The, the financials, the facility issues, there's a whole lot of questions that I'm way out of depth there to try and understand. But um, I certainly think, again, the timing is right. In terms of my world, which is now the world of disability, when I say my world, again, I'm very, very new to it. And I'm shocked and I'm disappointed in myself that it's not till you get in that world that you start to see things from a different angle. Um, and so I, I'm constantly saying to my guys that the challenge out there is there is a default mode. It's not negative, it's not intentional. It's just that people haven't had exposure to some of the issues that I'm now seeing. We have a beautiful young man um, who qualified to represent Australian Mocha for the first time since 2000. He shouldn't have made these games. We had him targeted for Tokyo, but he wasn't going to have that. He needed to be there in Rio. Um, he drinks at my local coffee shop. He was known as the latte kid. I thought I was the flat white kid girl. <laughs> anyway, so in talking to him, I just asked him his story, you know, and there's a bread shop next to our cafe. And he said, you didn't see that? I can't get in there unless I carry my own little personal wedge to get into the shop. And it's like, wow, didn't think of that one either. So, you know, I think from my point of view, now that I'm in here, now that I see the power of, of our elite athletes, and let me tell you, they are elite athletes, forget any preconceptions um, you had, some of the, the achievements, the, um, the hard work, the, the sacrifices they put up there, just as their able-bodied counterparts do. I'm not a fan of that able-bodied word, but at the moment it's the jargon. But, you know, so I think they are the elite athletes. We are starting to get a bigger voice. You know, our first and foremost priority at the Paralympics is to deliver on top five performance because that's what we get a lot of our funding for. But we have an absolute responsibility to take the voice of those people and not to people who say, look, I'm never going to be a Paralympian. That's not what it's about. It's to put a conversation around these issues, to talk to the Department of Disability um, pensions because pensions have been cut off and they because of a bureaucratic sort of mindset at certain levels. So for me, you know, it's not to go in there and do that. We're not about participation, but it's about taking our opportunity. We are the lead brand, I believe, in the world of disability sport in Australia, and we need to shine a spotlight on some of those things. So, you know, that's a microcosm of why we're here today, as in a mega sporting event. But it absolutely is, you know, those things all bundle up, don't they, to the top. So I'm really keen to understand that. So you, you mentioned you were here to learn today, and I just think you've been modest in terms of what you may be doing going on. And I was intrigued at Tokyo 2020, you know, the first delegation that came to talk to you, where, where were they from? Oh, the Human Rights Commission. And it was six months or more ago, mm -hmm. um, and we got the email. Since then we've had four or five, and wanted to know about 2000. First it's like, it wasn't around in 2000, but my very good friend Lois Appleby was. So I run here in Canada straight away, as they tell me. Um, so I was able to provide information. I was worried about not having anything for them. But my other thing was my default mode, as I keep saying, the default mode when you're not in this world was human rights due 2000, 96 at all. Um, so it was actually really good um, conversation for me as well, um, handing out. And as I said, that's well and truly ahead of, of where they need to be in terms of their planning. And 
and I was intrigued with your broadcaster perspective as well, because you, I think you had an insight in terms of Channel 4. I mean, hopefully all of us in the room are seeing the Yes I Can uh, video from... And to Channel 4 had a reception yeah. um, at British House, because they have lots more money than we do, so yeah. I changed a lot to theirs. With the view of meeting Dan Brook, who's the, um, the, the marketing guru, I was told I was responsible for these. What I was really blown away was they had the, um, I don't think they could have involved in how we want to grow the Paralympic Games, and then the minister got up and very bluntly said, we have changed our model of how we operate based around Channel 4 and the way they go about things. So, Asian World, and he's given me these amazing brochures on Channel 4's commitment to diversity and inclusion, which made me realise that's their core value. It's not the sponsorship of that. So, it was about a core commitment, and I guess, John, just to bring it back to you in Washington, in terms of answering the question, how do we move forward on exporting events and human rights? <laughs> but I know you're all talking about it on Friday. I mean, that clarifies, you know, that, that, that sports will get the OECD context as well, and the Swiss government has, you know, ruled that FIFA is an economic enterprise where, where governments and, 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 and uh, business need to stand together around uh, around this. I believe that there's a solution to this that isn't a collective action solution. I mean, I think that's the one thing that came out of DC too. But it's got to be done through impartial process. There's got to be trust. But it's dead. And the way that's going, you know, broadcast rights, uh, the revenue there is much greater than sponsorship. And it was only over around what their responsibilities are and issues like um, um, self censorship and in how they, you know, uh, well, what it will say, of course, is that sponsorship is moving around the world. Um, FIFA, the IOC, if, 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 if sponsor A, and really, and, and this is so important as well, it must, we're not sending the message that everything, you know, it, it can't be protectionism, it can't be exclusion of certain governments, certain parts of the world from, from participating in the hosting of these events. So that's a delicate balance if we think about it. Yeah. In this country, and over a decade sitting on the AFL Commission, I don't think we discussed human rights in the Indigenous lens, um, as you might have seen played out through the Adam Woods issues uh, last year and the year before. But I think national sport organisations really do, uh, and people get frightened by that term. And I think you're right to say it's a generational shift because those that are comfortable with the human rights, am I going to be hauled before a commission? Am I going to, and of course in Australia, we've had the terrible demonising of human rights in recent um, months and year. Um, but my, my sense is that we would have done better on the Adam Woods issues and, and issues of its kind on individual action that required what was fairly poor response, but where the community showed the governors of Gambia what was required. Um, so the, the notion of a human rights lens and a framework of that is that is part of the government's role. Mm. David, just to get an international perspective, is this a peculiar Australian experience that we've been having where human rights have been, or has it been a different pathway from a, from a Commonwealth Games Federation perspective? Yeah, you know, I think, I think we are better connected and better informed Globally, then you can be honest, you can be brutally honest with us, David. <laughs> the position that we needed to be courageous um, in our conversation because we were incredibly vulnerable um, and I think we're pushed. We were, you know, 50 deaths in Devon, um, you know, that should have never happened. And, you know, on, on, on anyone's watch. And if we commit to that, then we should deliver on it. And it's very, very simple. And these events are like to go all over the place. So we're going to ground it to some real issues and drive um, drive things forward. You know, and I think that's really you know, we were we were in a very interesting place. And I think the world right now there has been a major, major shift. But we've faced some major cultural issues. You know, where our about uh, the very values that we uphold are being questioned. And so it's not just a talk shop any longer. We can't just claim to be uh, accessible and inclusive and act uh, that here is that we need to show that we are doing the right thing by all people when it comes to the events. And that comes down to, and, and it's not um, you know, just the organizing committee's response. They're indicators of where are risks, but also where are those opportunities and what can we do within the period that we are hosting these events? And you know, it's, that, that's, there's, a, there's a zeitgeist out there 
and that federations are being put under an enormous amount of being put in that vulnerable position, I think will make the Commonwealth Games more relevant and more resonant as we move forward. Um, and you know, certainly that is our ambition and our hope with each of the hosts that we are, are working with. Uh, to make sure that the questions now, and that's an interesting frame, framing. There's a human rights zeitgeist out there. So I know we've got a range of sporting bodies and others in the room. Who's feeling the human rights zeitgeist? And that's <laughs> that. Apologies while we do that. We'll just have to shut the microphones. And if you could just introduce yourself. No, absolutely. So Nick, Nick Hockby from Christmas Day. Congratulations on today. I think it's a fantastic gathering. Um, I. Uh, what David said very much resonated, and I'm on my um, lucky enough to be starting the planning of my, my third gift. Um, for six years with Lowcog, I've just worked on the Cricket World Cup for the past three years. We heard about how London was a game changer for um, the Paralympic movement and diversity. Uh, on the Cricket World Cup, we very much um, uh, community engagement, particular tissue. So I suppose my question is this. Uh, we talk about a human rights framework. Um, is, is there a conventional framework that encompasses all the strands and, and elements of human rights? Or just, uh, I suppose, as, as organising the, ne the next event, keen to understand if we just go for gender equality, um, are we missing lots and lots of other things? Um, should, we, should we try and cover all the bases, if that makes sense? So to split that, both ways. There's the risk and the opportunity side. On the risk mitigation side, uh, you need to look at all human rights. Um, you need to see those that are the biggest risks, and so the most salient, and make it, you know, push the needle on those. Um, you, you can do that legitimately if you're adequately diplomacy movement out there, that a number of governments and the IOC are behind, which is great. But what's been missing is, is the risk mitigation piece. That, that's, that's kind of happened over here. Perhaps you've got a view in terms of um, advising Cricket Australia. Do you take an issue specifically? Uh, what, I, what I mean by that, you know, when you look at um, accountable um, and I guess accountability um, is, is really the, 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 the key. And, and assurance, accountability and assurance coming into the executive leadership. Um, because ultimately the book stops a culture that's driving issues like environment, sustainability, health, safety, and well-being, um, <coughs> you know, access and inclusivity and, and, and diversity. It, you know, and it almost becomes second, second, second nature, which had all of those component pieces, all those component pieces that were poured directly into, um, and they was also part and parcel with my risk management. So I was able to do risk management that the think uh, to, to this is to, ensure that we do we identify the opportunities. I completely agree with John. You can have one or two opportunities, maybe maybe three or four, depending on the context you're working on. Um, you need to ensure that you understand what you're trying to achieve. I found that you know, when, you're, when you're tackling human rights issues, or you, know, you can really you can do one or a combination of all three of those uh, those types of actions uh, to push the push things forward, and it's just really being very clear and mapping that out from the beginning and giving everyone to. Thank you. I'm going to swap for this a little bit. Um, and a really interesting piece of research was post London, um, and have a, an element of some rare components, but clearly not obviously it's their legacy wouldn't have been um, gathered yet. But it, it basically had a great phrase that said, you know, if you really want to create as an event of people. Um, you know, and I know you guys do lots of research, it'd be almost a matter of, you know, you might have a view to what you think, clearly gender is looking like it might be um, a part there, but if, if the conversation is had with, as I said, through the research, or just identifying what are some of the challenges that need to be, is when you stop measuring, you know, so I think you have to be conscious of that. But I think that was a really, as I said, just a couple of phrases that I really liked, because we might think we know it. Um, in a previous life, I was a marketing manager of a rugby league team called Canterbury Bulldogs in the mid-90s, we were known as the family club, and it, it was a family, and my family was very personally involved. So the assumption was we were very women friendly, and when I started marketing manager, it kind of changed hands, and nothing in the toilets. The programs, which include sponsoring the local netball competition, and, and pretty quickly we shifted that 23% to 42. Mm -hmm. So I think it's really understanding your community and what you think will be the legacy in your own backyard. 
conscious of time. So I just want to see who else has got a question. There's one there. What I might do is just take, has anyone else got a dying quick that'd be great. Hello, I'm Claire Martin from the Northern Ireland Human Rights Commission. Firstly, I wanted to thank the Australian Commission for inviting us here today. And we are here to learn from the Australian Commission and its model. Um, the Northern Ireland Commission are currently the chair of 21. So we feel we're in a, in a unique position in developing um, human rights and into mega sporting events. What I wanted to ask the panel was really for, his, for, for their advice in terms of building momentum, particularly from the business community. That's great. Thank you, Claire, and welcome. I Thanks. I'm Chris Sadoti from the Human Rights Council of Australia. I'm Chris. And the, the, our little NGO was the organisation that ran that conference in 1999 that John, you referred to. Um, one of the things that came out of that conference 16, 17 years ago was the set of business, but the principles on business and human rights don't apply specifically to the sporting dimensions. And sport is also much more than mega events. The mega events are only the tip of the iceberg. I mean, is there any process by which the overall relationship between business and human rights is being considered? And specifically... We'll start with the last one, and then we'll work through the panel for final comments. I'll, I'll, I'll get each of you to respond. Uh, table. Um, I think the governments behind those principles think that's the beginning of that journey, but they're very top-level principles. Um, and there's, there's, there's the need to drill down from them. Um, there's also the need not to reinvent the UN guiding principles between Brendan will talk later today. I don't think necessarily the UN guiding principles gives you, on business and human rights, gives you absolutely everything in terms of human rights and sport. Um, there are some gaps, but I think it does cover 75, 80%, particularly around the events themselves. If your question is how we get this through the world of sport more generally. I don't think anyone's really thought that through yet in this room, is once we manage the risk, human rights, you know, the world of sport is perhaps a huge untapped resource in terms of communicating human rights directly to, to human beings, um, billions of them, you know. So the upside is huge. How we, how we do that, I think it's going to take a long 5, 10, 15 years to, to, to really realise that opportunity. And that brings me on to the Northern Ireland question too, how we, how we live. I think there's also beyond that, you know, the, 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 the role of, if you think about social media too, and, I, and we have quite a lot of sponsors involved in our process too, what's interesting is both the broadcasters are going online, but a lot of the AB and InBev, AB, AB InBev, which is huge, one of the big FIFA sponsors is now has a global time with Facebook around FIFA events. So I think if you think about social media, <coughs> the number of businesses that are looking for social media profiles, sports is a huge of a particular event, I think. Um, yeah. Chris, I was just add a little bit to, to John's comment. I think that um, there are new mechanisms emerging for the integration of human rights in sport um, not least of which is the Sustainable Development Goals. At the gathering of those goals in 2015, I was ex it was extraordinary to see the number of sport aid and development community applying the SDGs. There's a number of organisations rising, Child Fund, um, a number of the youth organisations, Sports Matters, are using human rights traditions to take sport in what John was describing. But I think it's, this is one of the really long games that you're, rising, you're, you're raising and needs a lot of work. Um, particularly in the national sporting fields and down into community sport. Because we know there's huge failures on human rights in now, right down into community sport all over the place. And we see that through lots of, something that Lynn said about her research. I think the best way to engage with sport, to business and to sport, is to reach out and listen to what business wants. And, and do the research, don't just assume that business wants to, gets the message and understands what it is you're selling. So I think sitting down with leading businesses around their social licence, what it is, any assumptions. And the world is changing dramatically in terms of why people get involved in, in, in sporting organisations. And you might find sponsors in areas you never thought of. So I'd, I'd, I'd build a, a very wide uh, net of businesses you want to reach out to and listen to for young people everywhere. I might just add to that too, Claire. Um, that's been one of the challenges that I've been excited about. Um, in my job, when I came in, you know, everyone said, oh, it'll be easy to sell the business during a game.
some of us thinking of yourselves as a different um, a different entity, and it's the intangible that you bring. So it's almost saying what we're saying to our people that we're talking to now, that we are literally a platform for change, a platform for encouraging um, diversity of thinking. So I've done some homework on one of our part of the end of the conversation. They were able to see that what I was saying is, apart from the fact that we have female design athletes anyway, but the fact that we can go in and, and our stories, our people getting in there and talking about their way of seeing the world, the challenges they have every day, and how they got around it. Both sides of the fence either have a good commitment to um, human rights, diversity, inclusion, whatever charter you, you can find on them, but at the same time, if they don't, then obviously you can go in and, and help them address that when you've got a committed leader. So it's a fair bit of homework behind it, but it's actually a really exciting opportunity. Gonna have to knock on a few doors and get a few slams, but I think the more of us that are out there trying to talk that. And on the opening panel to you. Yeah, I, you know, I think uh, if I, if I take the second question um, first, um, you know, I think if we look at it, you know, just something that John said, I think we're, we are, you know, 1968, Mexico, and on the jersey, um, shared by those other two, the other two medalists that said the Olympic Human Rights Project. You know, I think we are at a, a moment in time where the international and uh, we are, you know, I think what we will see over the next 20, 25 years is a broader conscience and conscience which will ultimately change the culture of sport. Um, you know, I think the, the, the Sydney conference systems and how we measure success, you know, is going to be a long road. And I think, you know, it's going to take one federation at a time to really, um, it breaks the narrative saying that uh, some of the best ways of getting communities involved in championing uh, human rights and having those expectations that these events you want to go you know, deliver uh, positively is to clearly outline. Um, and it can be as simple as some big value based words with a list of activities that they this is what we're committed to doing, um, and you publish that, but you also, at the same time, look for uh, community benefit clauses in all of your tenders and the contracts, and you also manage your contracts to uphold the diversity. You go through all of those, you know, it, it, it's, you know, it's, it's very well um, <laughs> documented out there. The resources are out there. The health is there in the Institute of Human Rights and Business just to give you another plug, John. Um, but you know, I, do, I, I really think, um, you know, if you're in that during the journey to an event, to make sure everyone's upholding, upholding those standards and, and, and ultimately being accountable. That's great. And thank you, David, for uh, staying up so late. And can I invite everyone to please thank our opening panel uh, to wave you back in here very shortly. So make the most of the morning too. Thank you. Thank you. David.